Well, it is an exciting time to be at Grace Chapel, and it's an exciting time to be here today. So if it's your first time here, if it's your first time watching online, it's the perfect time to be here for the first time. Because today, we are talking about what our church is all about. We're going to start out talking about what our church is all about. And so if you're new to this area, you're new to uh, coming Forsyth County or somewhere nearby, and you're looking for a church home, guess what? Today, we're talking about what our church is all about. So you can find out if this is where you want to be. In fact... Uh, If you have been here for a long time, some of you have been here for a long time, we're about to celebrate 20 years uh, here at Grace Chapel, which for some of us is a long time, and other times that just seems like yesterday, Uh, but we're excited to celebrate 20 years, and maybe you are part of that beginning uh, experience. If you wanted Grace Chapel to have a presence in this community, you knew that this this community needed a church that had a presence in this community, and maybe early on, maybe early on, you made a lot of sacrifices, maybe you made a lot of uh, financial sacrifices to make this place happen. Maybe you volunteered your time, but over time, maybe you have forgotten what this church is all about. Or maybe uh, you have a friend or someone you know who started coming to this church um, who has has started changing, and and their values have changed, and the way they talk has changed, and their energy has changed. I kid you not, I had a conversation with someone who came recently specifically because of that. They had a friend or someone they knew that came and started changing, so they came to check us out. What was going on? I kid you not. This is a direct quote of what they said. I didn't even like blank until he started coming to this church. (laughs) And the thing is, is that could be said about me. If my family hadn't connected with a church like Grace Chapel, if I wasn't connected with a church like Grace Chapel, you probably wouldn't like me either. And there's a lot about me now that I don't like. I wouldn't like me either. So being part of a church like this is so, so important. Or maybe, maybe, you're here and you're looking for something. You're not really sure what that something is or what it looks like or how to begin finding it. And this morning, I want to talk about what our church is all about because maybe, maybe it could be that. But before we talk about what our church is about, I would like to begin by talking about what our church is not all about. In fact, I want to give you two myths, and these are, these are two myths uh, about our church, and quite honestly, I don't know how prevalent they are, but I hear them talked about uh, occasionally, um, and so I just want to make sure that you know, if you're new, you're, you're considering being part of this church family, you're interested in what we're, what we're all about, I want to make sure you know right up front that these things are not true. Or maybe you've been coming here a long time, maybe you thought, that's why I'm here is, you know, because of these things. I just want to let, let you know, these things are not true about us. The first is this that this church doesn't have an agenda. It's a myth. This church does have an agenda. In fact, I would want you to know that right up front. And sometimes I hear people say, you know, and, and I, I think I know what they're saying, but uh, it's so nice to come to church and, you know, just to connect with people and not just have some agenda being forced down your throat. And Maybe they had a bad experience somewhere, and I can understand that, but you should know that this church does have an agenda. In fact, I'm going to tell you what it is here in just a minute. The next thing, the next myth is, is that this church doesn't like change. And I'll tell you, that's a myth. In fact, before I got into ministry, uh, I was in public accounting, I dreaded Mondays. In fact, I dreaded Sunday afternoons because Sunday afternoons meant that Sunday night was coming, that Sunday night was coming, then Monday morning was coming. I dreaded Mondays. Since I've been part of this church, since I've been on staff of this church, I look forward to Mondays because our staff gets together and some of our different teams get together. You know what, we talk about what happened over the weekend, what happened last weekend, what happened over the last month, and then we try to figure out, well, how can we make that better? How can we be more effective in ministry? How can we be more efficient in ministry? How can we get more people involved? So if if we're talking about improvement here, as we're talking about improvement, we want to improve. Well, with improvement comes change. So you should know these things right up front. This church does have an agenda, and we do like change. But we do have a problem. We do have a problem, and, here, and here's the thing about this problem, um, and it's actually kind of a common problem, though just because it's a common problem doesn't mean that, you know, that's an excuse that we can just live with it. Uh, in fact, we have a problem, and it is our problem. We need to take ownership for this problem. Uh, I really like that the way the, uh, the Greek philosopher Epictetus put this. In, in fact, this, this is a quote from Epictetus that I saw, you know, every time I went in my dad's office. It was hanging on his office door. Every time he walked in, this is what he said. I really like the way he says it. He says, this is our predicament. 
this is our predicament. Humans, we've got a lot of problems, right? You know we've got a lot of problems. Well, this, this is the big one. Over and over again, we lose sight of what is important and what isn't. Isn't that true? Over and over again, we lose sight of what is important and what isn't. And if you're a parent, you know this, because sometimes in your life, you get going with all work and with all different hobbies, lots of things that are going on, taking the kids to soccer practice. And the next thing you know, with all the things going on, you have neglected one of your primary responsibilities, and a problem arises. You're like, oh, why did I do this again? This is what really matters, not all these other things. Over and over again, we lose sight of what is important and what isn't. And so this morning, I would like to give you two questions that will help you stay on track. Two very critical questions for your home, for your work, and in the church as well. In fact, nearly every meeting over the last several months, I have started with these two questions because they're that important. The first question is, is what are we doing what are we doing? Because if we don't know what we're doing, then we might start doing something that someone else is doing, and it might not be what we really want to do. And so the first question is, what are we doing? And the follow-up question to that is, why are we doing it? What are we doing, and why are we doing it? Why are we doing what we're doing? These are so, so important. So this morning, I want to start out, and I want to give you the what and the why of Grace Chapel. I want to give you the what are we doing and the why we are doing what we are doing. Here's what we're doing. We are leading people into discipleship. We are leading people into discipleship. Now, you hear the word discipleship a lot. In fact, it gets used a lot in church settings like this, and we use that word a whole lot. Uh, and oftentimes, we accidentally start using that word to mean things that it doesn't really mean. Discipleship, actually, is just a unique relationship. Discipleship is a unique relationship. It's different than a friendship. It's different where you come together because you have common interests. It's, it's different than uh, a marriage where you commit to life, or different than family. You, you commit to life in spite of your differences. It's different than a business partnership. It's different than all other relationships because discipleship is the only relationship. Hear me, hear it. It's the only relationship where one party wants to be exactly like the other party. It's the only relationship where one party wants to be exactly like the other, uh, the other party. And so we want to lead people into discipleship of Jesus where they want to be just like him. And you may be sitting there asking, well, why is that? Well, it's not. It's not because, or not just because, I should say, that Jesus was the smartest and wisest person who ever lived, though he was. It's not because he lived this perfect life and, and didn't do anything wrong. That's not the only reason. The real reason is that he, well, he predicted his own death and resurrection, and he pulled it off. And I just think, I don't know, I just think, anybody, that can predict their own death and resurrection and pull it off. Well, we should just listen to whatever that guy says, don't you think? And so that's why we want to lead people into discipleship of Jesus, because something else that Jesus did, he just kept making it better and making it better. When he rose from the grave, he opened a door into heaven, not just so that when we follow him, we get to go to heaven, though we do. He opened a doorway to bring heaven down to earth, where we get to start enjoying the benefits of heaven on earth right now. Disciples of Jesus, we don't have to live in fear of not measuring up to whatever we think we need to measure up to or what other people think we need to measure up to. Disciples of Jesus, we don't have to live with the anxiety of not knowing whether our needs are going to be met. Disciples of Jesus, we don't have to live with, with the guilt of past mistakes or, or current mistakes because that's all been taken care of us. So the why behind why we're leading people into discipleship is because discipleship of Jesus offers the benefits of eternal life right now. That is our agenda. That is what our church is all about. And if you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, that's what your church is all about, it happens to be what I'm all about. So if it happens to be what you're all about, if what we're all about is what you're all about, then that's great. In fact, I hope you're sitting there. I hope you're asking this question. This is a really important question. If that's what you're about, and that's what I'm about, or that's what I want to be all about, and I hope you're asking, 
Well, how then do I fit in? How then do I fit in? So today, I want to talk about how do you fit in? How do I fit in? How do we all fit in? Thankfully, Jesus made it so, so clear, as we'll see in just a minute. And he's going to help us answer this question. After we answer this question, then I want to give you one thing. One thing that could change everything for someone. One thing that could change everything for someone. You with me? How do I fit in? And then, just one thing. So thankfully, because of Jesus' clarity on earth and his clarity with his disciples, he really just kind of gave us one thing. And that one thing was referenced earlier in this message, which is a new command. Not 613, not 10, not even two, just one. In fact, when this one command is put into place, it puts us in a right relationship with all other people. And in so doing, it puts us in a right relationship with the Lord and our Heavenly Father. And so he, Jesus got all of his disciples together. He pulled them together the night before he died. And he said, hey, a new command I give you. A new command, a new command. So he, they're grabbing their notebooks. They're about to write this new command down. And he says this, love one another. And they're looking up, well, that's it? You love one another? Yeah, that's it. That's the one command, love one another. And as they're writing that down, he says, hang on, hang on, hang on. Come here, come here, come here. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. As I, you, you, everybody else. And the next day, he was going to make that so very clear to them by laying down his life. But that night, if you could have seen the communication in the eye contact between Jesus and Matthew, I think the conversation would have gone something like this. Hey, Matthew, you, you remember when I accepted you and I invited you into my personal space? Matthew, do you remember when I brought you in Remember when I accepted you and no one else would accept you? I want you to do the same thing for Peter. Hey, Peter, later on tonight, you're going you're gonna to deny me. Three times. No, I'm not. No, 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 you are. And when I accept you back in, Peter, when I accept you back in, I want you to do the same thing for James and for John and for everyone else in here. In fact, I want you to do that for everybody else in here because as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now, thankfully, Jesus made this very clear for us, but he didn't stop there. He went even further, and he painted a picture through his stories and his interactions with people of what this looked like. And on one particular occasion, we find in Luke chapter 14, if you want to turn in your Bibles there, in Luke chapter 14, we find that Jesus is the guest. He's an honored guest at a dinner party. And this is not just an inner dinner party. This is like a, a, a swanky dinner party. All the people, all the who, who's who are there. And Jesus is there. And because Jesus is there, well, he starts offending people pretty quickly. In fact, near the end of their dinner, Jesus turns to the host. <laughs> now, I want you to know something about this host. This wasn't just any host of a dinner party. This was a very prominent religious leader in the community and he had invited other prominent religious leaders in the community and so jesus is about to call out the host for who he's invited to the party then jesus said to his host he says when you give a luncheon or a dinner don't invite your friends or your brothers or your sisters or your relatives or your rich neighbors now at this point the room got a little quiet because that's all who was there. Jesus explains. He says, if you do, they may invite you back, and so you'll be repaid. You have them over for Friday night, they'll have you over the next Friday night, and then they'll have you over the next Friday night, and you'll have them the next Friday night. And what's the point of that? You missed an opportunity. He says, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Now, there had to be been like an audible chuckle through here. <laughs> Invite the who? Invite the poor. What would they wear at a party like this? Invite the, the cripple and the lame and the blind. How would they even get here? I don't even know people like that. Jesus, what are you talking about? When well, he says, well, not only 
in inviting these unexpected people to a party like this. Not only will they be blessed, but you'll be blessed. You'll, you'll be blessed by inviting them. He goes on, he says, Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So here's an opportunity. You can invite your friends, your relatives, you know, your rich neighbors, or you can invite all these other unexpected people. In this case, you're going to be repaid next Friday night. <laughs> but in this case, oh man, let me just tell you, my Heavenly Father, your Heavenly Father, He's going to repay you. And let me tell you, if you've got a choice between the two, you want Him to repay you at the resurrection of the righteous. It got really awkward in the room. Nobody really knew what to say. One guy was sweating at the end of the table. Like, what do you say? I mean, the host, what does the host say back to that? So Luke goes on his story. He says, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, well, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God, right? I mean, that's really what matters. I mean, Jesus, you're talking about, you know, the guest list of next Friday night's party and who we should invite. But, I mean, isn't it, isn't it better to be invited to that party than who you're inviting to this party? It's so much better to be invited to that party. And Jesus turns to him. Classic Jesus, Jesus fashion. And Jesus starts right into a story. He says, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. Here, Jesus is equating God himself to this, this certain particular individual who's preparing a table before people. He's inviting a lot of people into a party. And, and Jesus is equating that party to the kingdom of heaven. So a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Hey, please, take me off the RSVP list because I'm a landowner here. I don't care about being a landowner there. I'm a landowner here. I'm important. I'm rich, okay? I'm rich here, and I'm fine with this. So will you take me off the RSVP list of your big party? I got things going on. The second said this. Can we hit the next? There we go. Another, another said, I just bought five yoke of oxen. I'm on my way to try them out, and I don't blame them. I don't even know how to work five yoke of oxen. Please excuse me. Take me off the RSVP list, okay? I'm a busy man. I'm a businessman. I got lots of things going on. Please take me off the RSVP list. Still, another said, I just got married, so I can't come. At least, you know, give me a little while. But go ahead, take me off the RSVP list. So the servant came back and reported this to his master. The owner of the house, Luke describes as Jesus' story, said, the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And here's where Jesus ties back what he was saying earlier and who you should invite to your parties. You should invite all these unexpected people. That's who he was intending to invite anyway, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, and here is one of my favorite lines in the New Testament. In fact, as a, as a servant of God, I hope that I could respond to something that the Lord asked me to do with this kind of confidence. The servant said, what you ordered has been done. I already took care of it. They're on their way. They may be coming a little bit slower than everybody else, because th their friends are guiding them and leading them here. They may be coming a little bit slower because some of their friends are carrying them on mats to come here, but I already took care of it. They're on their way. And here is where Jesus really is calling out the people at the party who thought they were servants of God. Because he says, my servant has already invited those people. He's already invited them. They're already coming. And then I love the way that the servant responds next. He says, but there is still room. Master, what do you have for me next? What can I do for you now? Then the master told his servant, go out 
into the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. This is good news for all us rednecks who live up here in Forsyth County. We're getting an invite to the party. He says, compel them to come in. Compel them to come in so that my house, my big, very large, and beautiful house will be full. And as the servant turns to go, the master says this, I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Not one of those who thought they were a servant. Not one of those who I'd given responsibility to. Not one of those who I'd given much, who I'd given gifts and many blessings. Not one of those who I'd entrusted with much influence in their community. Not one of those who thought they were a servant will even get a taste. And so the bottom line of the story, and this is my paraphrase of what Jesus might say, is... I'm inviting unexpected people to eat at my table. I'm inviting unexpected people to eat at my table. You should do the same. You should do the same. And so this morning, if you're asking a question like this, how do I fit in? How do I fit in? I want to give you just one thing, one thing that could change everything. For someone. In fact, I think you'll find that it's something, this one thing, is something that somebody has done for you, or maybe is doing for you now. One thing that could change everything for someone. I want you to invite unexpected people to eat at your table. I want you to in invite people into your personal space. Jesus wants you to invite people to pull up a chair, to feed them. Jesus wants you to invite all the people who aren't invited to the parties. But here's the deal. I want to take this up a notch because it's so important. It really is one thing that could change everything for someone. In fact, it changed something for me when I got a seat at the table, when I was included in someone else's circle, when I was accepted when no one else would accept me. And what I want to do is we just want to make this a habit. And not just any habit, we want to make this a keystone habit. Now, you may not have heard this terminology before. I've talked about it in here before, but a keystone habit is so important. It's one really small habit. In fact, it's a small behavior that gets repeated and leads to other positive behaviors. A small behavior that gets repeated and leads to other positive behaviors. An example uh, is food journaling. You start writing down everything you eat, then you stop writing that you had ice cream for dinner the last four nights in a row. You start eating different things so you can write those good things down in your little journal. When you write those things down, you start feeling a little bit better. When you start feeling a little bit better, you have more energy. <laughs> you have more energy, you exercise. You exercise, you sleep better. And the next thing you know, you feel better. And that one really small thing of writing down what you ate had a cascading positive effect on all of your other behaviors. So this one thing that could change everything for someone, we want to make that a keystone habit in our lives. We want to make that one thing something we do all the time because of how impactful it could be and how meaningful it could be in someone's faith and in their relationship. So I want to give you four words. Just really four words, because inviting unexpected people to eat at your table boils down to these four words. It's pretty simple. And the four words are, come eat with us. Hey, come eat with me. Come eat with us. Hey, you should come eat with me. Hey, come eat with us. It's that simple. It's not, can you say that with me? Hey, come eat with us. See, that's so easy. Come eat with us. But what I want to do now is I want to provide you the timing of when you should say that. It's so simple as you've already done it. Come eat with us. Here, I want to provide you are some status cues because every habit has a cue. Every habit has something that prompts you to do that habit. You don't think about brushing your teeth at night. You don't consciously think, oh, I've got to brush my teeth. You just do it. It's a habit because you've done it since you were a small child. And so I want to give you the prompting now of when to say those four words, come eat with me, come eat with us. The first is this. Whenever you hear someone say in this terminology or something else, I'm new here, 
maybe they're new to work, new to the job, you know, and they're just trying to figure out, you know, you're showing the road, they're trying to figure it out, hey, I'm kind of new here, hey, you should come eat with me. Or maybe they just moved to the area. They just moved to come in, you know, their kids are in school, and they're trying to figure things out, you know, we're just unpacking boxes and everything, hey, you should come, you should come eat with me. Anytime someone's in transition, I just had a baby, or we just had a second baby, we just had a third baby. You better invite them to come eat with you. Because when you're in transition, it's so easy, it's so, so easy to get disconnected. But four simple words could change everything. Hey, I'm new. Come eat with me. The next is, I'm never here. I'm new here, I'm never here. You know, this is something that people don't often say, but they say it in other ways. They say, oh, yeah, we got to take the kids to school, the soccer practice, and we're busy with work. We got lots of plates spinning. My mom's in town this week, and, and I'm just never really here. I got a lot going on. We got a lot of plates spinning. I, I'm never really here. Hey, you should come eat with me. Come eat with me. It's that simple. Because when people are in transition like that, or when they're so busy, and they're juggling so many different things, they may be missing out on a relationship that could change everything for them. I'm new here. I'm never here. And this third one, this is one that almost no one ever says, but they communicate it. It's a nonverbal. This third one is, I may as well not be here. You know, I, no one really notices me. I, I may as well not be here. You know, I, I don't really fit in, you know. I don't really fit in with everyone else. I, I may as well not be here. No one really likes me. No one really, you know, takes that extra step to, to even see, see about me. You know, and I, I'm just kind of lonely. I, I'm really just misunderstood, but, but I, I'm kind of lonely. I may, I may as well not be here. Hey, come eat with me. I'm new here. I'm never here. I may as well not be here. Hey, come eat with us. These are important transitions in people's life. These are important times where people need to connect with someone else. And if they don't connect, they could become so disconnected that it's almost too late. Come eat with us is so, so simple. But it could change everything for someone. And I know some of you are sitting there and you're thinking, yeah, that sounds pretty awkward. Come eat with us? I'm supposed to just say that anytime I hear somebody say, I'm, I'm busy? Hey, come eat with us. What? <laughs> but the thing is, is it's, it's, it's so important, and as awkward as it is, it could change their lives. Well, I know you may be sitting there, you may be thinking, yeah, but I'm not really that outgoing, and I'm kind of an introvert anyway, and I don't really know how to cook, I don't even know how to, you know, have people over, I'm not really sure how to do that, and I just bought five yoke of oxen anyway, so I'm trying to figure that out as well. But here's the thing. This is so, so important. And this is one thing, one simple thing that can help you fit in. Because when you invite people into your circle, when you invite people into your personal space, you're leading them into a relationship with you. You're leading them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Can you imagine what would happen in this community if Grace Chapel was known for just constantly inviting people to dinner, for constantly inviting people into your personal space, can you imagine how much more effective we would be at leading people into discipleship if we were known and we made it such a habit of inviting people into a relationship? I can imagine at some point we're all going to be sitting around the table of the Lord in the kingdom of heaven. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you can probably imagine what that would be like. Because you may already be experiencing the benefits of eternal life right now. And at that table, you're going to be able to look over and you're going to be able to see someone. And you're going to have the joy and the thankfulness in your heart for how they invited you in. And that simple gesture of inviting you in had a profound impact on your faith and your walk with Jesus. And so here's the opportunity, and here's the challenge for you. Who 
is going to be sitting at that table looking back at you with that same joy and that same thankfulness in their heart for those four little words, for that one thing that changed everything for them. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much um, for uh, this place, for Grace Chapel. I thank you for the hearts of the people who are here who I know want to invite people in. They want them to experience Jesus. They want them to be in a relationship where they want to be exactly like him because they know that that relationship will allow them to begin enjoying the benefits of eternal life now. And we look forward to enjoying eternal life when you come back again. And we look forward to being at that table. I pray that you will give us the courage to say four little words. I pray that you will give us the courage to do the one thing that could change everything for someone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.